we take the water from that pond, pump to a reservoir similar to this, and then to the reactor. But with heat, does it affect the quality of the water or life in the pond? For many years, laboratory scientists have studied species that inhabit Par Pond and the surrounding terrain. The years of study have revealed some facts. Mass population has increased. The fish are larger, up to 10 pounds. There are roughly 300 alligators now living in the lake. This one measures 15 feet. Most species thrive in the warmer water. Research shows, in fact, that industries waste heat can be used to increase vegetables in temperature-controlled greenhouses, or even for catfish farming, to produce crops as large as 100 tons per acre per year. And it may well have many more important uses. In any case, waste heat can be controlled in man-made lakes like Par Pond, and where acreage is at a premium by means of huge cooling towers under construction at California's new Rancho Seco nuclear generating station. Still, we must know more about industry's impact on natural waterways. The AEC's Savannah River plant is adjacent to this relatively pure stream and covers an area of 312 square miles. On this large land area, we have five nuclear reactors, three of which are operating two chemical processing plants, a heavy water recovery plant, and associated uh, fuel manufacturing facilities. And it was for these reasons, because of these large facilities, that the Atomic Energy Commission was concerned in the early days of the project what impact we would have on this river from the standpoint of radioactivity releases and thermal effects. River studies were begun before the plant was built. And so our studies include water resources, in other climates and surroundings. Ecology research for more than 20 years has kept pace with the development of AEC's Hanford plant, a vast complex of nuclear power and production facilities. For ecologists, Washington State's Columbia River has been a rich source of information. A man who knows this river well, Bill Templeton. Now, despite the significant increase in this research, we are still not able to predict exactly the biological cost or the biological benefits of adding heat to our water bodies. But we have made great strides forward in defining some of the criteria necessary area on their migration to the sea. And of course on the return from the sea the adult has to move up the river, pass in some truth uh, to other reaches for spawning, put their eggs uh, in the area. A dynamic river food do they find as they pass through the warmer water, the thermal flume. One of the most interesting series of experiments involves the drifting of young uh, migrating fish uh, down through the thermal plumes. Now the thermal plumes only cover a small cross section of the total river, but some may be carried into that area. Experiments with, with adult fish are a little bit more difficult because they weigh between uh, 8 and, and 15 pounds. The sonic tag is a small electronic device. It emits a sound that we can follow as the fish move upstream. He seems upset, but it will give him no discomfort at all. In order to determine whether there is a, a thermal blockage caused by the uh, thermal plumes to the upstream uh, adults, uh, we have been using sonic tags. Our studies so far would indicate that we do not have a thermal blockage or that it does not significantly affect the rate at which the fish pass the area. But there is more to learn. Side by side with industry, can the river function as nature meant it to? Within what limits can we subtract from key resources or add pollutants? Our water resources or the irreplaceable film of atmosphere that clings to Earth? at AEC's Brookhaven National Laboratory, Mr. Manowitz. The atmosphere is a complex laboratory. One of the tools we use for studying the pollution patterns in plumes from utility power plants is an airplane such as the one we have here. 
This is one of several that we use in this study. They're outfitted specially for obtaining information on a series of meteorological conditions during the run, and also outfitted to get us some special information having to do with particular pollutants in the plume. We're concerned about the use of coal, oil, natural gas, gasoline. All of these produce pollutants of various kinds. Sulfur dioxide, oxides of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, a host of others. All of these pour from industries, stacks, and the stacks of power plants fueled with coal and oil. In contrast, nuclear power stations emit no dense plumes that pollute the air. Nuclear fuels produce none of the contaminants we've been considering thus far, but does produce very small amounts of radioactivity. However, there are federal regulations that control the amounts that can be put into the atmosphere. Radioactivity from all industrial sources has been under strict control since the nuclear industry began. Nuclear wastes are at case in point. Unlike some of the hazardous wastes produced by other industries, nuclear wastes are processed and permanently and safely isolated from man's environment. But we have just begun to recognize wastes like these as a threat to life. The program starts with learning what happens to plumes from individual stacks in rural areas. We then begin to, to study the pollution patterns in small cities. And ultimately, large urban centers where the effects of air pollution are most pronounced. As we continue to develop this information, and as we feed the information into public health agencies, what we hope to do is to strike a balance between the risks we take in accepting certain levels of pollution and the benefits we would accrue by reducing these to minimum levels. Man is beginning to realize for the first time in his history that he must manage the world ecosystem in cooperation with nature, not against nature. And this is the business of science, to build and innovate for man. But first, to understand how nature works. The ultimate challenge to man is indeed an ecological challenge. It's the challenge to keep the green world a healthy, living, viable place. Men and science, and a thousand hidden strands of nature yet to trace. But try to imagine a world without the fruits of industry, the things technology provides. Man is at the crossroads. He will need wisdom to remedy abuses that retard the flow of progress, and hand in hand, a plan to keep Earth livable and its beauty unimpaired for all the centuries to come. Unmistakably, not one of nature's store of treasures can be destroyed or spent without some cost to all of life. Man must weigh this sober truth against his vision of a rich and perfect world to come, but still advance and grow and not turn back.